time once again for the Post-Prison Education Program radio show. And we are lucky to have back with us live here in the KODX studios, Ari Cohn. He is a founder and president of the Post-Prison Education Program. Ari, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Mike. And uh, let's... Um, Let's start out. You've uh, you are just uh, fresh from an event that uh, uh, involved um, one of your graduates. Yeah, we just uh, yeah. Look at my T-shirt. That's like uh, so. We've had eleven or twelve people go through the Divers Institute of Technology, which is a super expensive, incredible program, but very expensive. And uh, a guy named Max Willard graduated today at two o'clock, like a nine nine. GPA 0.99 out of 100 and was president of his class and got a hundred dollar bonus for perfect attendance and was one of the people chosen to speak at the graduation and uh, if you're on if you can get to my Facebook page there's some good pictures there and then I think Shalisha Hudson has some pictures on her page and and then we'll put some pictures up on the post prison page later tonight but it's a, a guy who Came out of prison about eight months ago. Came out to work release. And um, uh, the staff at Bishop Lewis work release was phenomenal. And, and, and let us work with him to go to the Divers Institute while he was still a prisoner. So he was getting up at four in the morning and going out to Ballard and, and, and going to DIT. Um, and now seven months later... You know, he graduated. And I got a kudos to Theo Lewis at, at DOC headquarters, who's in charge of work releases for the Department of Corrections. Uh, to get Max to DOC, to Divers Institute, we had to have a county of origin exception. And so uh, I think Danielle Armbruster, who's Assistant Secretary of Reentry, and Theo, who works for Danielle, uh, but they they turned the world upside down, literally, to do uh, sort of a last-minute county of origin exception, get Max up here to Reynolds, I mean, not to Reynolds, but to Bishop Lewis, and then into DIT. And so he graduated today. His mom was there. His dad was there. Um, a puppy dog was there. <laughs> it was, like, super cool, super cool. And, again, uh, part of this reflects – I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, uh, issue that you regularly bring up the count, the importance of county of origin, yeah. and in this case, uh, it it uh, through your work and allies in the DOC, it worked out. Yeah, it just it, it, it almost always does. I mean, it's it's county of origin. It's just so simple. You don't need to go back to the county where you where your crime came from. You know all the wrong people. You generally don't know the right people. You know all the dealers. You know what street corner you go to for this, that, and the other. And you just don't need to be there. And uh, his, his county of origin was out at, at Shelton, and uh, where there was, they just like, he got involved with drugs and addiction late in his life. And, but once he got hooked into that, it, it meth, it was like three incarcerations bullet fast. And so we didn't, first of all, we, he couldn't go to DIT if he was out in, in Mason County because they started like seven in the morning. And, and, uh, and, and so we, he had to be in King County to go to the Divers Institute. And, uh, uh, and, and the other part was he just didn't need to be out there. I mean, to the extent that we can outlaw a student doing anything, we're like, don't go to Shelton. You know, you know all the wrong people don't go to Shelton, and and so, but it's just it was phenomenal. He, the, everybody at the Divers Institute, which is just phenomenal, phenomenal, crazy, phenomenal place. They they love this guy, um, wouldn't shut up about him. And like I said, he was the president of his class, and I think he spoke four times today at the graduation. <laughs> so it was like it was super cool. And he so he, so now he's like, he's he's got two interviews um, in the morning. Uh, for jobs. And what we've seen in the past is um, people will people will uh, uh, 
get a job very quickly and go from being a prisoner or a student at DIT to working in Alaska in the oil fields or the Gulf of Mexico in the oil fields, start out at about 5,500 a month. After a 90-day trial, jump to about 8,000 a month. One of our, the, the second person that we worked with to get into DIT years and years and years ago, uh, a guy named B.K. Ammonworth, I think he's making about 165000 a year now. Traveling the world, he's sort of world famous. He's a, uh, so anyway, it was a great day. And here's my T-shirt. <laughs> and, I, and I'm loving it. So let's talk about the DOC's MAT program and drugs in prisons and drugs after prisons and lives being destroyed. Um, okay. Uh, what is the MAT program? So... It's, I have to look it up in my, it's medically assisted treatment. Uh, Medication assisted treatment? Is that me right? Medically, okay. medically assisted treatment. So you can go to the Post-Prison Education Program Facebook page or my Facebook page and there's a post about it with a link to the Department of Corrections. Uh, they put up an article in 2018 that's, you know, that reads like, here comes the DOC, like Paul Revere riding through Boston to save the colonies, right? You know, and that's not, the article doesn't portray the, the mayhem and literally death and the relapses that's going on out of this program. So I thought I want to like kind of ease into this by talking about how I got interested in this and my my history with this and with the whole topic of drug use in prisons. And, you know, many years ago, a guy came out of the Washington State Penitentiary and we, we set him up to go to Columbia Basin College in Pasco, which is a phenomenal school. And he had serious mental health issues and serious addiction issues. And while at Columbia Basin, we thought he had like a psychotic break because he crashed out of college. And then he was running and gunning. And, and it took forever for us to reel him in. He was dating a, a, a woman uh, who also was highly addicted. Um, and... Um, it just took forever to reel him in. And finally, we got him to agree to meet us, and uh, a bunch of us drove down to Kennewick, and we met him at the Olive Guard restaurant, Garden Restaurant in Kennewick. And his girlfriend was there. They're married now. They live in Mississippi. And, and, uh, and I think I had three people from my office with me. And I was stunned when this guy said to me, Ari, at lunch, we're sitting at Olive Garden. He says, I didn't relapse. I never quit using. The guy came out of the Washington State Penitentiary West Complex, which is as high security a prison as there is in the state. I mean, it's like when you go into the West Complex it, or Special Offender Unit at Monroe or an intensive management unit anywhere, you just you get the feeling like, Somebody could drop a nuclear missile on this place and it wouldn't even chip the concrete. I mean, this is a fortified, high-security place. And here's this guy saying, I used throughout my incarceration in this high-security prison. And I was really blown away, and I've never forgotten it. And, and that might have been 10 years ago. It's been a long time. So, like, jumping to the MAT program in sort of present-day history, we had a student who uh, you had on Mind Over Matters with his daughter and uh, Joe Jensen and me went at KEXP. And uh, uh, six times in prison, documented serious mental health issues, went through the Crossroads program at the Moreau Correctional Complex, which is to help people with mental illnesses released successfully and uh, we we uh, well just to make a long story short I, we know as a matter of fact this guy was clean and sober 
I think that's the key part. And the, and, and the, the other key part is that until a, a DOC mandated psychiatrist at Valley Cities out right across the street from North Seattle College uh, mandated that he go on Suboxone to prevent a relapse by a guy who was clean and sober for two years. I mean, and documented clean and sober. Until that happened, he was a straight-A student at, at North Seattle College. He was, uh, I mean, really straight A's, like a 3738 GPA. Um, we built up enough confidence in, to, to, I personally guaranteed rent on a three-bedroom house in Shoreline because criminal records scared the landlord. Um, and, and so he, and we got his daughter moved down from Bellingham to get away from a horrible situation up there. And his son wanted to be part of that. So we had family, right? in this really nice home out in Shoreline and, and everything's fine. And then, uh, one day in the office, this guy, the student of ours told me that and somebody else on our staff that the, the psychiatrist that the Department of Corrections was requiring him to see at Valley Cities was was wanted was forcing him to get on Suboxone. And uh, and, 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 and that and that happened. And he flunked out of school. Um, so he went from straight A's, completed his first quarter after six years of Six different imprisonments and 20 years in prison, straight A's, right? Just great parent, future envisioning, everything's right, and they put him on Suboxone. I was, uh, and, you know, um, when that happened, that really got my attention. I mean, it's, I, I, at this point, I think I, this, I, he, this this person has talked to me in terms. He literally told me once. He said, "I I can't face going back to prison again. If if, the, if it ever comes to that, I'll kill myself." So where things stand today, I mean, I've been on the phone and an email since quite way early this morning with with the guy that owns the house. There's legal proceedings going back and forth. The guy, he's the student's not a student. He's not in school. His daughter's back in Bellingham. I don't know whether she's homeless or not. Um, and he can catch. He's either going to get violated and locked up, or catch new charges, uh, or maybe take his life. You know, if he sees that coming. And and so things are as bad as they can be right now. And and that was precipitated by the Department of Corrections, Northgate office, mandating that he go to Valley Cities, behavioral, whatever, you can Google them, and, and, and the psychiatrist at Valley Cities mandating that he be on Suboxone. And for those who don't know, I mean, just, just like, I guess you could call that like a legal form of meth. I mean, it acts a lot like meth. So, and so I was talking to a lawyer the other day about this, and, and and she described this as pharmaceutically induced relapse. But the, but the whole, what, so one of the things that's going on with MAT, the MAT program, is they're taking people who are clean and sober and they're forcing them, the DOC might say offering MAT, the MAT program to them, which raises other problems, but they're, they're pushing these people to get on uh, Suboxone. And, well, even if you're clean and sober, so you take a clean and sober, this blows my mind, you take a clean and sober person, um, and in this guy's case, clean and sober for two years, and I, and I want to interrupt myself, he, he was clean and sober coming out of the prison, he got UA'd uh, in the vernacular, piss tested the first night, can I say that? I'm all, I'm, so, uh, the first night of freedom at the first Oxford house we had him in, and, and he was okay. Then the second Oxford house, we moved him to clean and sober. Um, when the discussion came about being him, and him being with his son and daughter in an $1,800 a month house, then we not only had him piss tested, but we had hair follicle tests done, which covers 90 days. He's clean and sober there. He's clean and sober with UA tests 
at uh, at the Department of Corrections when he checks in with a CCO up until they put him on Suboxone. So we, we know this guy was clean and sober, and and, and yet he was forced into to, so so it's just it's the the great term I'm I'm not going to say the attorney I was t- talking to but 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 you know the first thing that came out of her mouth was pharmaceutically induced relapse. So you take somebody that's clean and sober and you force a relapse by putting them on Suboxone. That is insane, effing insane. So that's that's happening. Um, so so then then skip forward quite a few months and I'm in a prison and a fairly high up person in DOC tells me about this commission, as I call it, uh, on on the Facebook page that's been established to figure out how to address the this opioid crisis, right? And, and really, how how to to how to disperse a, a significantly large federal grant? You know, how to use this federal money to address the opioid crisis? And the person I was talking to, the DOC employee I was talking to, told me their feeling or their intuition was from from what this staff member was telling me was that the department was looking to move to put all, emphasis on all, A-L-L, all prisoners who were about to release on Suboxone prior to release. That was like, this is really crude, but I mean, you know, if you heard Donald Trump sign an executive order making it legal to have sex with three-year-old children, I'd, I'd believe it, right? <laughs> because that's Trump, but but that this was on the order of that. I mean, you're talking huge numbers of people. Um, 18,000 people in Washington's prisons right now. The average sentence is 22 to 24 months, so you, you move out pretty quick. You know, you're not in prison forever. So there's 8,400 people coming out into the communities a year, 700 a month. And this DOC staff member was, was the, the tuition, uh, intuition was, was that they believed that, that DOC's intent was to put everybody regardless of whether they have drugs and addiction in their life or not, on, on Suboxone prior to release. And so I knew there used to be um, a phenomenal guy at the Department of Corrections, David Daniels. He was in charge of research. And he told me in writing once that, that he believed that like 78% of Washington's prisoners have drugs and addiction in their life. So if that even is approximately true today, then 22% don't. But whatever the percentages are to take a non-addict and turn them into an addict, that's part of the of the, this uh, of this MAT program. I mean, that's criminal. I think it's criminal. I wrote an email to everybody that I've talked to in the last week, and a few that I haven't. I sent uh, an email to today, uh, and it, it, just making sure that. We were all on the same page, and um, and I and I closed the email by saying, as it stands today, I strongly believe the program they are implement they have implemented is immoral, amoral, unethical, wrongheaded. It's just insane. So, and, and, and if you look at what happened with our student, it, it it's destroying people and not only individual prisoners former and current prisoners but it's destroying their families it's just but but to to take a, to take so two parts clean and sober person who does have drugs and addiction in their life and may be involved in their criminal cases and you pharmaceutically induce relapse that's wrong 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 it really has moral ethical implications it rises to a level that everybody should be, like, more concerned about than I can even state. I mean, it's it's horrible, right? It's 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 uh, so and and then to take non-addicts and turn them into addicts by putting them on Suboxone. I don't know. That's beyond the pale. So that and and so that's going on and that and in the prisons. So I I heard this information about uh, about. 
from this DOC staff member. And, and then, and again, I just sort of tabled it in the back of my mind, although I, I thought, like, this is horrible. So last week, knowing the show was coming up, and, and, and Catherine and Hannah and I are trying to figure out, like, what's going to be the topic, then I thought this needs to be the topic. And so I wrote this DOC staff person that told me about that commission or whatever and, and that established Matt. And, and I'm like, do you know anything more? And I didn't get a response initially. I got a response a day late. So I decided I'll just put this up on our Facebook page, which has like 23, 24,000 people on it, and see what happens. And then I tagged myself, which put it on my page also. There's another 3,500 there. And, um, um, and, and and then I got a call from somebody who I didn't even know, who works at the Department of Corrections. And they saw that post because we have a Facebook friend in common. So and that's how Facebook works, right? And they've messaged our Facebook page, and I think you saw it, uh, and it was like, I really need to talk to you, and you really need to talk to me. And so we talked two days ago, and, uh, and that really, in the, the putting, and the all was confirmed, and even though the lawyer hadn't yet put, put a name on pharmaceutically, and pharmaceutically induced relapse that was confirmed uh, that non addicts were being put on suboxone that was confirmed and that this came from the from the governor's office which is something that we all really need to talk about so it's like you know i know steve sinclair who's secretary of dsc i've known him for a long long time and uh back when he was superintendent at the washington state penitentiary and I don't see Steve implementing a program like this. I don't see Steve of his own accord or his assistant secretary, Rob Herzog, ordering non-addicts to be put on Suboxone and turn them into, and, and what this person that called me from DOC told me is this came down from Inslee's office. So if you're secretary of any agency, DOH, DOT, DOL, DSHS, DOC, and the governor tells you to do something, you better do it. I mean, I've seen, or you won't have a job the next morning. You know, you, and, and so this, so it was confirmed that this came from Inslee's office, and which I have no trouble believing. I absolutely, I absolutely despise this governor. I mean, I can't even explain to what degree I, I what he's allowing to happen within our prisons and on the streets is outrageous and unjustifiable but um but so he he ordered this and so the doc has no choice but to implement and if sinclair was to say you know balk at that because then he wouldn't be secretary anymore he'd be retired and kayaking in walla walla or whatever and 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 so then um i had an appointment we're working on a clemency case uh, for a woman who I believe, and actually, if we have time, I'm a, would like to talk to, about her case without naming her. But, but uh, we hired a lawyer some time ago to work on a clemency case for this woman, and I had this prisoner who's done 23 years already against a 40-year sentence, and I think she shouldn't have been sentenced to, for even a day. Right? I don't think she should have gone to prison. She should have gone treatment. And so uh, I had an appointment with Marla Zink, who's this lawyer that we hired uh, on this clemency effort. And, um, but once I got off this phone, the phone with the person who called me from the Department of Corrections about Matt, how Matt was being implemented, when I walked into Marla's office, I'm like, how can we address this? And one of the first things out of her mouth was, have you talked to Satterberg? Have you thought about Satterberg? He's the King County prosecutor. Is that He's correct? the King County prosecuting attorney, right? And um, and I'm like, and I, I I was like the Ford Motor light bulb went on. I was like, because that was she was that was a good place to start. So 
Um, so, I mean, I had thought of all these like Columbia Legal Services lawyers that are allies and, and Disability Rights Washington, super allies, super amazing people. Um, but I had, Satterberg hadn't crossed my mind. And so I, I sent Carla Lee and Lisa Mannion, Dan Satterberg's deputies, de deputy chief of staff or something like that. and and. A quick email I was like I need to talk to you yesterday not today but yesterday and so we ended up with Carla on the phone and this is when this story really set me off because so we told her everything that we had learned from everybody that we had talked to and then she told me that she had been out at, at Purdy at the Washington Correction Center for Women about two weeks ago at a black prisoners caucus um, political event which BPC was putting on because the legislature's in session right and a woman a prisoner who was supposed to speak about the tr these, these horrible transfers that are happening to women down to the Yakima jail and they are horrible uh, for the women and their kids and family and uh, but she spoke about having been forced onto Suboxone. And so here's like the deputy chief of staff for Satterberg witnessed a current prisoner, heard a current prisoner so passionately talking about this having happened to her that she's in tears. So you got DOC staff in the room, you got stakeholders, you got media, you got prisoners, um, and this woman is opening up regardless of the fact that staff is there. And, and, and in tears, talking about the fact that, that she had just been forced onto Suboxone. And, and, and what I'm told by two attorneys and uh, somebody who's very instrumental in, in Black Prisoners Caucus here on the streets um, is that, that she emphasized that drugs and addiction are not part of her life. NOT, not part of her life. Not part of her criminal cases, nothing to do with why she's in prison, but the department put forced her and, and, and what I'm hearing is that they might use the term offer but they use it in the strongest terms you know they you know you were, we're offering you this opportunity to get on mat well if you're clean and sober for a year or two or more you don't need this you don't need that opportunity to be offered to you and if you're not an addict at all and drugs and addiction are part of your life you darn sure don't need um, yeah, I didn't even say damn. Uh, you darn sure don't even need, you know, to have this opportunity to, to take Suboxone offered to you. And, and, but it was, it was pushed on this, this woman, and she was upset about it, as she should be, to the point she was, like, crying in tears. When I heard that, when Marla and I heard that from Carla, then everything else we'd heard from everybody was corroborated. And then knowing that that was a black prisoner's caucus event, as soon as I left, I sent a friend, an ally, an email. So this is somebody who's very closely uh, involved in the black prisoner's caucus. And I sent her an email and said, we got to talk. And, and when we talked, it turned out she was there. And so she heard it. And then Marla was like, how about Columbia Legal Services? And I said, no, I, and we both know Nick Allen really well, and, and who's an attorney at Columbia Legal Services. And, and, um, and so she said, well, I'll write Nick and, and, and start that communication. And, and so yesterday morning, Marla and two attorneys at Columbia Legal Services and I had a Skype for business conversation about this and it turns out Nick Allen was out there at that BPC political event and he also heard this prisoner say the same thing so um, and was that news to all those people when they first heard that yeah okay. yeah I don't think um, I mean the, the the reaction that I've got I can't I've talked to 25 or 30 people uh, some lawyers uh, you know spouses of prisoners, uh, activists, uh, 
over the last week about this, and everybody's reaction is that this is just horrible beyond belief. It's just incredibly horrible beyond belief. And so, um, and it, it, I want to. So I want to. So in my mind, it's it's real. It's it, 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 the next step is if you go to our Facebook page and you click on this link, you'll see that this isn't just in prisons. It's on the streets. And and so the program, the map program, has two is, sides. Is one side in prison, the other side is on the streets. Oh, hmm. But the same thing is happening. So on the streets, if if you're on probation or under community corrections supervision, and you uh, you violate, right? Matt says that the CCO is supposed the probation officer is supposed to take you not to jail which is the old way it would have happened, uh, but take you to one of six centers that they've set up statewide where you'll be put on Suboxone. And um, so, so it's happening in the communities and it's happening on the streets. It's like they're taking, if you're a prisoner or former prisoner on probation, you're being driven into this Suboxone program. It's, in my mind... They, somebody somewhere, uh, maybe it was somebody took Jay Inslee to the Seattle Tennis Club and, and bought him a better lunch than he's ever had down in Olympia or something, whatever. But, but uh, somebody somewhere, maybe it's just somebody high up in a pharmaceutical company that makes Suboxone, but somebody somewhere doesn't care about prisoners and former prisoners and their families and basically is willing to um, just box them off as like this horrible population. Let's box them off. Let's, let's, you remember Thorazine and Ritalin and back decades ago when everybody was, you know, they were prescribing Thorazine for adults and Ritalin for kids. It was like zombie you out, right? And, and so let's just like put, the whole population on Suboxone, and which costs a fortune. The, the cash flow on this, somebody ought to do a Public Records Act request and see how much the Department of Corrections is paying for all the Suboxone and how much they plan to be paying a year from now. And then somebody in Satterberg's office ought to be looking at what's going to happen in his jurisdiction with all these people on this drug running around the streets. You know, the, 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 the implications are uh, incomprehensible. Well, the article that you uh, linked to on your Facebook page um, mentioned the parent program uh, produced a grant uh, uh, for all the states, but for Washington State, the grant was for the year 2018 was just short of $12 million. Yeah, yeah. So would, do you think that that would pay for both... Um, the uh, the trainings that these people are getting, and then the uh, the suboxone and the different drugs themselves. Well, the other, I, I don't know. I know something about the cost of suboxone if you're out on the street trying to buy it. So if you're downtown Seattle on Third Avenue and you want suboxone, it's eight to ten dollars a strip. In the prisons, it's way more than that. It is the commodity in the prisons. They're not, you know, there's meth in the prisons, there's, there's heroin in the prisons, but the commodity that everybody wants is Suboxone. And, and, but on the streets, it's 8 to $10. I don't know what the DOC is paying for it, you know, buying in bulk. I have no idea. But, so I can't answer that part of that question at all. But I can tell you that the people that are assessing prisoners who are about to be released and then routing them into the MAT program, encouraging, urging them to go into MAT or forcing them to go into MAT. Those aren't qualified people. You know, the Department of Corrections doesn't have people qualified to make the assessment should you be on Suboxone for the most part. I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's a doctor everywhere, a doctor, right? But as far as people dealing with high volumes of prisoners who are being assessed. I don't think, uh, and you'll see some comments on, 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 if you go to the, again, to our Facebook page 
and there's about 25 comments on there, and some of them are pretty intelligent. And, and one of them seemed to be like a medical professional. I almost wondered if he is a medical professional, and I almost wondered if he works for the Department of Corrections. But um, saying to make this kind of assessment, you need to have at least these credentials, right? And it's more than an MSW. It's, you know, it's more than a master's degree in social work. It's more than a psych nurse. So I don't think, I don't think the intent really is to really assess for the better of the prisoner or the better of the prisoner's family or, or, or the person that's going to be put on Suboxone, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I think the whole purpose is just to, like, uh, this might be a little, well, I can't say it, I'm not going to say it. It's like. But it's all, it's just it's almost like uh, no I'm not going to say it but it's 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 just like let's just take all 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 of these people and route them into this program and put them on Suboxone. So, or one of the other because uh, the again the article listed three different um, drugs. That... But but people aren't getting like Vivitrol. I mm -hmm. talked to a, a, one of, Melody Simley who you know um, when I talked to her about this. She was like one of the driving forces behind the ombuds legislation. And, and she said, you've got to talk to this other person who I'm not going to name because they actually work for the governor's office. And, 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 and I'm like, I haven't talked to her, but I will. And so I called her, and she was like, uh, like Vivitrol. I haven't heard anything bad said about Vivitrol, right? If it, if so it's like the culprit, but, but Vivitrol isn't being prescribed. That's the problem. So that document, that DOC document, talks about Vivitrol and Suboxone and so on, but, and I think it talks about methadone, which is another issue. Mm. That, but, but Vivitrol isn't being offered. What's being offered is Suboxone. And uh, for those uh, listening, the, the name of that document that, uh, again, is on uh, off the Post-Prison Education Program Facebook page is uh, titled Corrections Takes Steps to Help Curb State's Opioid Epidemic, and it's uh, dated November 13th, 2018. Um, within that article, though, they, they, they do touch on, again, that um, the state is puts people who are who are involved in recommending the uh, and steering these people, at least that's my impression yeah. from the article, um, that they have uh, about 50 people as of the time this article was written, um, and it's based on a conference that also yeah. happened at that time, they have 50 people trained to be able to do this, um, and it sounded like it was a fairly uh, short training program that they go through for the state and or the, the federal government to qualify them to do this. But again, as you have pointed out, the people uh, in the conversations that you were having on, on uh, social media had said, um, no, that's not adequate, that, that um, each person has to be uh, looked at individually and it has to be by a very highly qualified person that has extensive um, training and knowledge and background in this. And it's not something uh, that one just picks up in three or four months of a, uh, you know, program during the evenings. Totally, totally. You know, so, so, so a lady who I know and respect, who's sort of a mental health ad advocate, and is on, mental, on social media a lot about mental health issues, she posted about this issue. And then, I, and then somebody in my office responded, like, the people making this assessment should be at least, they, they can't be like junior college people or community college people, or they need to be at least, I was, I would think at least like a master's degree in social work or a step up from that. So like a else, whatever, you know, licensed counselor, MSW or a doctorate in social work, or I was thinking like maybe a psych nurse. Um, but then some guy came in and he said, no, it needs to be at least these. So if you go to that, the, there's like 25 comments back and forth, and look for that one post. But it sure as heck can't be the regular DOC line staff person applies to have this responsibility, and maybe they went to junior college, or maybe they got a four-year degree, and maybe they don't have any of the above. But they can't. That's not adequate. You know, you're, you're turning non-addicts into addicts. And you're forcing relapse of clean and sober people. I want to like skip over uh, 
to what makes this without Matt makes this super complicated. So like uh, if and I just bullet point some things in my mind. So like a guy walks into our office or a gal walks into our office and they come in, they've been on a bus from Spokane, Medical Lake all day long or from Walla Walla or whatever. They got on one set of khakis. The 40 bucks they were given in gate money is down to $2 or none. Um, they don't have a house. They don't have housing. They don't have a job. Um, and they're addicted to Suboxone. I mean, it's active addiction. So they've come out of prison addicted to Suboxone. I think if they're in the MAP program, they might get Suboxone for a minute. Uh, but what if you've been just using in prison because Suboxone is rampant in the prisons and you're not in the MAP program? The f you know, we had Vincent Gronross on the show a month or two ago. And I asked him to talk about what happens if you come out to the county, uh, your county of origin, and you got no money, and you got no housing, and you got no support, and you it's you go into a store, and you you heist whatever you can, and then you literally run, and then you go to somebody who you know will buy that, and then that turns it into cash, and then you can go buy the suboxone or meth to 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 feed the addiction, right? That's what Satterberg and Jenny Durkin need to be looking out for. DOC is creating problems. They're going to land right in Seattle Police Department's lap, right downtown on 3rd Avenue, worsen that situation, clog up the dockets at the, at the Superior Court, um, cause new cases, cause people to recidivate, cause people to violate. Because you've got to have all these people coming out with no resources that are ad addicted. And... and, and so that's that's a big issue, and, and and then in the prison. So we had a guy, like I just described, walks in with this pathetic little plastic box, toothpaste, legal papers, maybe two bucks left, just a couple of days ago, and um, highly recommended, almost pushed on us by DOC at Airway Heights, and um, and he was talk. He sat in the office and talked with me about how his cellies uh, had, had been just constantly using. And that reminded me of the guy I told you about at the beginning of this program who came out of Washington State Penitentiary and then his life blew up. And then months later when we reeled him in and we're sitting at Olive Garden, he says, all right, I never quit. I, ne I didn't relapse. I never quit using. So this guy's like, he was talking about how hard it was to not use in the prisons because everybody's using. Um, I was down at Purdy. Um, a month or two ago, on a day or within a few days, because DOC staff was talking about it, of, of a woman came out of the Pierce County Jail, and as she came into the prison at Purdy, 13 grams of meth inside her body. And that kind of baffled me. If you came from the streets into DOC, but she came out of the Pierce County Jail, which is something of a fortress, right? into Purdy with 13 grams of meth. And so, you know, I, I've, watched, uh, I've watched the DOC, I mean, uh, years and years ago, for example, like at Coyote Ridge, you know, there was no, the, these lottery buttons, I call them. So there's like a red button, a green button, and, and it, it, that didn't use, and, and you push it, and if, if it goes red, then you have to be searched. If it goes green, you just sail on through. And, but before those buttons, uh, you just if you were staff, you just came in on the shift change. You'd see like lots and lots of staff coming in with like lunch buckets and you know backpacks and, and all of that. And uh, undoubtedly, some of those, maybe just one, but some of those people were bringing drugs into the prisons. Families are bringing drugs into the visit room. That, you know, um, I was talking to um, a DOC person today about the huge amount of drugs in the prisons that we're hearing about, and that person told me that the department just, just arrested and fired 
or had arrested and fired somebody, staff member, that was bringing drugs into a prison. So it's like, and, and you know, the Seattle Times doesn't put that front page. If a prisoner does something wrong, that's Catherine Long and Blethyn Blethyn and Blethyn Corporate will have that front page, page A above the fold. But a DOC staff member taking drugs in, not necessarily so. And But it, it, periodically you'll see an article about that. So that happens. But uh, a huge related problem that predates Matt is the Department of Corrections has not found a way to stop drugs from going into the, into the prisons in huge volumes. I mean, it's, it's obviously not true to say that everybody's using because everybody isn't using. Uh, but but it's, it's drugs are hugely being used. I mean, just out of control. And and line staff across the state talk openly about it. I asked the person who called me as a result of the Facebook post, when we're, that, that's what led to this person telling me that it was Inslee that ordered this and, as opposed to like Sinclair or Herzog or the whole executive leadership team getting together and figuring it out or whatever. But, but uh, uh, I asked, I'm, I'm like, I just straight, straight out, I'm like, did, did Herz, Rob Herzog and Steve Sinclair, do they, do they know how extensive drug use is in their prisons. And this person was like emphatically, yes, they know. But they can't, they haven't found the solution to it. And I don't know if you and I were all of a sudden secretary of the DOC, if, if we could find the solution, it, it's, and I think, tend to think we probably couldn't. Um, so you've got, I mean, you've got, you've got, Visitors coming in and they're not being searched or scanned, and so they can walk. They can walk in with Suboxone, or they or with meth in their vagina or rectum, or Suboxone in their vagina or rectum, and and um, and and then in the visit room you're allowed a hug, right? So you hand you hand it off with that hug. Um, so I, it's just it's it's uh, but you know I th I thought this implementation of this lotto system is what I call it you know where you push the button and you get red you got to be so I, w I was going into the West Complex with Steve Sinclair years ago probably he might have been assistant secretary then or he might have still been superintendent but uh, it was funny because he hit the, the button and he had to get searched because it came up red and I hit the button it came up green so I just sailed in so it was like funny but but even the secretary I, I mean I I don't know if Steve is secretary or Rob Herzog if they go down if they would be searched but as a superintendent um, you know he he the, the beep red he got searched um, that so that was a, a good step but um, and whatever happened to cause this most recent release that was a good step, and I, I, I at at the risk, and I'm going to go out on a limb on this. At the risk of um, pissing off every social justice liberal ally I've got, I've gotten to the point where I think when they find a prisoner bringing drugs, selling drugs in the prisons to other prisoners. They ought to be charged. I meant that because, I, you know, that sounds really prosecutorial, maybe Republican, but people that are selling drugs to other people for egocentric, avaricious, just money-grabbing, whatever you want to call that, profits or whatever, they're destroying lives. They're, they are destroying lives. Literally. Take that literally. They're... they're they're, at the best case scenario, they're making it so that when people come out, they're like this guy from years ago that can say to somebody, "I never, I didn't relapse. I never quit using. The whole time I was down, I made my the serving of my prison sentence be better, or more palatable, or easier because I was able to stay high." But people, you know, if you're going out, if you're going out, there's a huge drug problem at the women's prison, huge, and DOC admits it and they'll talk about it. Uh, 
so women go outside the gate to, to garden or what what all ever they do when they come back in drugs are coming back in um, it, and it, it and it's coming in the visit room, and it's and it's being sold. I I really believe, because lives are being destroyed, families are being destroyed. People are literally dying over this. Literally, according to studies by Mark Stern and Ingrid Bingswanger, people are dying over this. They're overdosing after release. They're committing suicide after release. I think people who are behind that should be charged. And I think I'm sure of this: the rumor mill inside prisons is off the hook. If something happens at Clallam Bay at 2.01 in the afternoon, they'll know about it at WSP by 2.30. Clear across the state because the, the word of mouth is that, it's that fast. And so if, if the word of mouth got out that people are catching new charges for selling drugs, for bringing drugs into the prison, for selling new charges, I mean, selling drugs within the prison, I think it, it wouldn't stop it but it would reduce it. And I think, I think that the state should look at that. So um, there's, there's nothing worse than seeing somebody you care about commit suicide because they can't manage addiction uh, or co-occurring disorders or see their families. I walked into Shalisha's office within our office the other day and there's an artwork from a guy who I won't name and he died under a bridge in Spokane shortly after release. So a woman that used to work for us, Shelby Shepard, uh, put her heart and soul in preparing this guy for release. Uh, but when he came out very quickly, he was dead. And and uh, you know if you if you know people, and then they die, and you know somebody is responsible for it. And I think that person should be held accountable. I mean, the whole period. I'm done with that. Um, we we got eight minutes to go, it, but it's just so the whole thing is really complicated. It's like, you know, if you you offer or urge somebody who's not an addict to go on a prescription for Suboxone through the MAT program, and they know they can sell those strips for eight to ten dollars on the street, or they can sell them for even more in the prison. You think they're going to say no? Don't put me on that program, or they're going to say, "Yeah, load me up, mother," you know, "put me, sign me up," you know. And then they get the prescription, and then they and then they don't take it. They don't ruin their lives. They sell it. So it's, it's like a, it, it's incredibly complicated. And honestly, my thinking on it hasn't even gotten close to solidifying. I, I think Carla Lee and Lisa Mann are going to set up a meeting for at least Marla Zink and I to meet with Satterberg and, and them next week. And uh, our plan is to bring Nick Allen from Columbia Legal Services with us. And, and uh, um, and, and, and just keep talking this out until we come up with something that makes sense. And then uh, and then hope it can have a have a, a solution can be found. Right right now though, I mean the largest the larger problem seems to me to be unsolvable, and that's the extent of drugs in the prisons and on our streets. You know, uh, somebody was writing on Facebook the other day about Jenny Durkin sailing around the city in her chauffeured SUV, and you know protected by cops and guards because she's a former U.S. attorney and uh, is far removed from reality and what's happening on Third Avenue as you could be if you lived in Trump Tower in New York City. And uh, so, I, I, but drugs on the streets, it's out of control. I can, you know, it's just out of control. And, I, and in the prisons, and I don't know what the solution is. Um, but the MAT program the solution is, I think, to get the guy who ordered this to reverse the order, and that's Inslee. So whether it's media writing about what he's ordered be done, whether it's media writing about how the program is being implemented, whether it's a prosecuting attorney or a city mayor saying to Inslee, you know, the consequences of what you're doing in the prisons is huge in our jurisdiction and you've got to stop this you know uh, 
they, and, and, and somehow taking non-addicts and turning them into addicts and pharmaceutically induced relapses of people that are clean and sober, that's just got to stop. That's got to stop. And, you know. Well, it's got to be feeding. If this is occurring with the DOC, they, then they are feeding into the very um, things that we are seeing in the streets of Seattle yeah, currently. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. There's no... You know, I won't, you know, that, that, that murder and those seven shootings the other day, that happened at McDonald's. I, I was like a couple blocks away waiting. It, it, there was two shootings that day. So about 3 o'clock, I had come up out of the tunnel and got off Lincoln, was waiting for the 62 to go home, right? And I don't know how many SPD cars were going down 3rd Avenue at dangerous speeds. I mean, 25 or 30, at least 20. I mean, flying down the street sirens blaring and then that so that that was the first shooting and then but then a couple hours later was when that woman from plymouth housing was murdered and, but but the point is like i won't even go on that corner i won't use the tunnel behind mcdonald's because it's you're just walking through dealers i mean now spd has put these mobile stations out and they've and they've got spd and everywhere there but for years, I just won't. It was so obvious. It's dangerous. So I just wouldn't wouldn't be there. I wouldn't use that tunnel. I wouldn't catch the bus there. Like, uh, but you're right. It's it's Third Avenue is a disaster. Down by the Morrison, the DESC property, the Morrison, and that dried up fountain and what I call crack park that's between the Morrison and that fountain and and the jail. Uh, that's open drug use down there it, by the Chief Seattle Club. That's open open drug market. You can I I saw a Seattle police officer standing within 20 feet of a guy with a crack pipe in his hand about a year ago by the 7-Eleven in the Central Building. So it's like it is what we're talking about. It does feed that, and the more suboxone the Department of Corrections puts out on Inslee's orders, the worse it's going to get. And, and anybody that thinks that this is going to improve community safety is deluded. They're absolutely, they've been lied to and they're delusional. Real quickly, in less than uh, just two minutes left, um, talk about, quickly about the, uh, the financial situation for your organization. It's dire. Uh, you know, we're, I wrote a friend the other day that we're, so if we get an application from somebody, it's a complete application. They're a student, and we'll do everything for them that we can but spend money uh, up to $200. But if you're somebody and your needs are great, like you're released from DOC without housing and you don't have a job and you don't have clothes, we're saying no to everybody in, in, in that. We, 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 and, and that's because of an IRS debacle uh, that we just cured last Sunday at 227 in the afternoon. But we went nine months of last year without being able to write a grant. Uh, I'm glad you asked this, uh, because, because of an IRS mistake, which they have now acknowledged. Um, and and uh, so between losing Doris Buffett's funding when she devolved into dementia and then almost simultaneously this IRS disaster, which was just insane. Anybody who wants to know more about that, please write to me, re.cone at post because I'd rather slam the IRS right now than have gold bullion, uh, really. And, and, and but it's it's dire. So our our funding, we got a, we've got an infographic that that basically shows uh, that when we're fully funded, nearly everybody succeeds. If we're in the middle between full funding and, and dire, then some succeed and some don't. And if we are where we are right now, people die. You know, we turn people away. We don't say yes to their application. They recidivate. They go back to prison, or they overdose and die, or they commit suicide and die. And that's that's what happens. And that's where we're at right now. Pretty bad. In fact, it, it can't get worse. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. So. Uh, again, your website is postprisonedu.org. Prison, okay. And we'll put this up on our YouTube channel and elsewhere as soon as you get me the video. All right. So 
look forward to uh, doing this again next month. Yep.